Luke 14, starting with verse 12. Hear the words of the Lord. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in turn and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent out his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. The master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel men to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, None of these men who were invited shall taste my banquet. These are God's words. You may be seated. Uh, For those who are of the ages, three and up, you can join Sister Alden and Brother Matt for City Light Kids on today. They do have a wonderful time in City Light Kids Uh, So much so, I might skip skip out on y'all one Sunday to go in and enjoy. They get to color. When was the last time you colored? It's fun. (laughs) Amen? It's fun. We thank God for you guys uh, being here with us on this morning. If this is your first time with us, welcome to City Light Church. If it's not your first time, welcome back to City Light Church. We uh, see the brother from Atlanta made it in. He is burning up that road, y'all. I don't want to hear nothing about how y'all can't make it. This man drives from Atlanta to come here for Sunday service. Amen. Amen. For those who are watching online, we thank God for you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Again, we uh, give love and grace to our brother, our pastor, who is preaching in North Mississippi on this morning, uh, getting up for his second service on this morning. We're walking through the parables of Jesus here at City Light. Uh, A few more uh, uh, parables to go, and uh, then we'll turn our attentions elsewhere. But I pray that this time has been a blessing to you. One of the uh, uh, gifts of God, if you will, that I can say at least for myself and our time here, um, every time we walk through Scripture, even if it's a Scripture that I'm familiar with, hearing it opens up new things for me. Uh, God, through his grace, by his spirit, gives me different glimpses of things that I hadn't seen before. And I've been walking with the Lord since I was 16. Uh, But it is his grace and and, uh, just also goes to show what an inexhaustible resource we have in God's word. Amen. That no matter how many times you read it, no matter how many times you rehearse it in your hearing and in your heart, that God can always make it new for you. He who has an ear, let him hear. Amen. This morning, our parable is the parable of the great banquet. And I hope that, um, as we were just saying, that you hear something that refreshes your heart that's new for you on this morning. Um, I think most of you know that my wife and I have been married uh, 22 years Uh, This past May 20th, uh, we celebrated 22 years of life together as as husband and wife. And uh, I know some of you have said I look far too young to have been married for 22 years. But uh, we came right out of kindergarten and got married. So that's what happens uh, when you get married so young. Um, But it's been a lot of living. 
a lot of living that we've done in these 22 years. And uh, some of it I remember, of course, and, and, and some of it I do not. Um, I do remember our wedding day. Um, as there was some, some good and some bad, but I, I do remember our wedding day. Uh, I do remember choosing uh, invitations and stuffing envelopes to send out to people to join us, to invite them to join us for our wedding day. Um, I do not remember what those invitations look like, uh, but I do remember picking them out and, or my wife picking them out and showing me which ones we were going to go with. Uh, I remember getting dressed in my white tux and, and the little white socks that felt more like pantyhose than socks. I was uncomfortable wearing those. Um, I do remember gathering with my best man and my groomsmen um, there at the church and, and riding around a bit that morning looking for a young man who had uh, spurned my sister to have words with him. So I was a little, wait, little late to my wedding. Um, the preacher will fight. Y'all pray for me. Uh, I remember looking out over the congregation as I'm looking out over you guys and seeing college classmates from state and uh, seeing our family and friends gathered with us to celebrate uh, our union. Um, I remember my mom, I can't remember if this was before or after the service or the ceremony, but I remember my mom saying to me one last time as my baby, sit on mama's lap, uh, which I did. And my mom is like 4'11", guys, you know, 98 pounds soaking well with all her clothes on. And I, I sat down, and I, I did sit down. That's what she said, right? And uh, I remember her quickly mumbling in pain, okay, get up. Because uh, even then, I wasn't just a, a small man, especially in comparison to my mom. I remember my wife, uh, as she walked down the aisle, and uh, the song that I sang to her that I wrote specifically uh, for her for that day. You remember it, babe? <laughs> so sad. I take you to be my wedded wife lawfully to have and to hold you for all eternity. I vow to love and to cherish you for all my days. For better or for worse, this is what I'll say with this ring. You remember it now? Amen, amen. <laughs> now that I've properly embarrassed my wife, amen, amen. And the one video, the one video we had of that, somebody lost. Can you believe that? It was great, it was great. Um, as customary following a wedding, there was a wedding feast, a reception, a banquet. And it may be surprising to know, especially for those who know me, out of all the things that I do remember from that day, I don't remember what we ate. I love food. But I don't remember what we ate that day. I do remember feeling deeply loved on that day. I pray that my wife remembers the same Give you a little background for our parable on this morning. It follows the parable of the wedding feast and is uh, um, one of two parables that Jesus told during a dinner at the house of one of the chief Pharisees. While it was common for teachers to be invited over to someone's house following uh, for a meal, rather, after services at the synagogue, much like it used to be common in our day, in our parents' day, for the pastor or preacher to be invited over to share a meal after Sunday service. But this was not a time for fellowship. The Pharisees were on a fault-finding mission. They wanted to try to trap Jesus. You see, the Pharisee had it also invited a man with dropsy or edema. It's a condition in which the tissues of the body retain water, usually around the arms or uh, the legs. Condition that caused, uh, 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 or excuse me, a condition that could be caused with problems with the heart or the kidneys or the liver, and it was an untreatable and incurable condition. 
The host made sure to place this man where Jesus could not miss him. The goal again, much as it had been time and time again throughout Scripture, the Pharisees was trying to catch Jesus in a trap. You see, if he ignored the man, they could claim that he lacked compassion. He claimed to love God and love his people, but he lacked compassion. If he healed the man, then Jesus could be accused of breaking the Sabbath. Jesus, of course, knowing what was in their heart, Scripture tells us, for Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. Rather than being exposed, he exposes them. Verse 3 tells us, Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Getting no response from the people, Jesus heals the man and sends him on his way. Turning his attention again back to the lawyers and the Pharisees, he says in verse 5, Which one of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? Again, Jesus doesn't get any response from them. And Jesus uses this opportunity to confront the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, to challenge the false confidence of anyone who believed that they were right or could be right with God by their own standard. And to teach them how the invitation to God's feast really worked and who it was actually for. These verses confront us as well. They confront us and they remind us that God is on a mission, that his mission is to save the lost souls of men and women, and he has called us to join him in this mission. These verses also remind us that not everyone will accept the call to join God's mission. It is with this mission in mind that I want us to consider three things as we look at the text this morning. The invitation extended. The master graciously calls us to fellowship with him. The invitation extended. We also want to look at or consider the invitation evaded. We'll see several people who make excuses why they could not accept God's invitation. And we'll also consider the invitation expanded. The master, excuse me, desires to see his house filled. Amen. The invitation extended. Look with me at verse 16. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time... Uh, For the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. The text tells us of a great banquet to which the master of the the house had extended invitations. No time was noted uh, on the invitation, but the understanding of the day was that once all was ready, notification would go out to all who were invited, to all who accepted, and that they would come. Well, the moment arrived, all was made ready, and the master sent out his servants to gather the guests. It's important for us to note that this was not an ordinary invitation to an ordinary banquet. This was a great banquet. This banquet was better than tacos and ribs at the Crawford House. If you hadn't had that, then keep coming to City Light, amen? Amen. This banquet was better than waffles at the Cheesecake Factory on a Friday, which you can't get. I've tried. They only serve them on Sunday. This banquet was better than having Chick-fil-A on a Sunday, which again, you can't get because they're closed on Sunday. This banquet was better than going to your favorite restaurant, being seated immediately. Everything you order is cooked to perfection and seasoned to perfection. All your favorite people are gathered there together. They're all laughing at your jokes. That was not a joke. And everyone's food comes out at the same time and no one ever has to wait for a refill. This was a great banquet. What makes this banquet so great? It's not the food. It's the fact that this is an invitation to deep and meaningful, soul-filling, feast-like 
fellowship with God in the family of God that culminates with the receiving, or rather with receiving, the goal of your faith, the substance of our hope, eternal life in the home that the master has prepared for those who accept his invitation. A Jewish feast typically lasted for seven days. I called around and, or texted rather, some of you to ask how long your ceremonies and receptions lasted and the consensus was about three to four hours. The joy and enjoyment that we receive or will receive enjoying God's banquet cannot be rivaled by anything on this earth. It's an experience of incalculable worth and unlike any fleeting pleasure or celebration on earth, this is an everlasting celebration. And yet, one by one, everyone who was invited began to make excuses for why they couldn't keep the previously accepted invitation. Again, the word goes out at the end of verse 17, come for everything is now ready, but they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. I don't remember how many invitations we sent out for our wedding, and I, I thought, but I couldn't recall if everyone we invited actually made it out, but we've heard, certainly had other gatherings since then. So I'm sure you've had uh, gatherings in your time, and sometimes you find that expectation of attendance is met with disappointment. Sometimes in our day, it's through a text message minutes before the engagement, Right? why we can't make it out. Sometimes it's even a call after the function has already started. You begin to get reasons why those you invited can't come. I say reasons, our text calls them excuses. You see, the expectation would be that those who were invited would drop everything, whatever they were doing, they would drop because the, to accept the invitation in that day beforehand and then make excuses when the day came was a grave insult. And yet the excuses come. When a feast of this magnitude is planned, it's not a spur of the moment thing. All of those invited would have received notice well in advance. Each one of them would have already promised that they would attend the event. The host would need to know how much food to prepare and how much wine to have available, so he would need an accurate account of who was coming. Makes sense, right? We even do it here. By the way, again, don't forget, there are sign-up sheets out front for the marriage boot camp, I mean, state treat. So please sign up so we'll know how much food to have available later. Amen. We won't be serving any wine, but there'll be food. So the day for the feast arrives. The host sends out his servants to call those who had been invited to the feast. And they knew the date. And they were to be prepared and ready. Everyone knew that the banquet was being prepared and they were supposed to have cleared their schedules. And one by one, again, Scripture tells us that they all began to give excuses. Other things, other people took priority over their attendance to a banquet that that he had already said that they would come to. So by their excuses, the invitation was evaded. Excuse number one, one man said he was too involved in his business. He had bought a piece of land and he needed to go look at it. Has anybody here ever bought any land or house? I know some of you have because I helped you buy it. Who bought the land or the house without looking at it? Anybody? Nobody does that, right? But here this man says, I bought a piece of land and I need to go look at it so I can't come. Please have me excused. 
A person can easily become too involved in any business, any work. Not just the business of buying or selling real estate or developing property or farming. Any person's business, any profession, if we're not careful, can consume us. Other things simply fall away as being less important in business or work is all that matters. Excuse number two. Another man said that he was too wrapped up in new purchases. He had just bought five yoke of oxen and wanted to try them out. Now, I've never purchased any animals, but I do have a little dog. Everybody here has probably heard of Zoe. She's my, my heart. And before I got Zoe, before I gave her the money for Zoe, hey, I need you to bring her here. I need to see this dog, right? Who purchased animals, livestock, before they check them out? But this man says, excuse me, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I have to go and see them. Who hasn't among us invested time in new purchases? No one buys a house or a car or a bank or a bike, excuse me, or books if you're our dear brother Matt, a board game, or any number of material things, uh, uh, who makes that purchase without wanting to invest time enjoying them? Nobody, right? But the Bible tells us over and over again that material things can take root in our lives. And again, if we're not careful, the love of these things can become the most important thing in our life. Excuse number three, which I love because he doesn't really give an excuse. He just says, I can't come. Still another man said he was too wrapped up in his family. This man had just got married. You know that marriage is ordained of God and that the scripture says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. We celebrate marriage here at City Light. We invest in marriage here at City Life. This is another reminder, it's just built into the sermon, to sign up if you have not already signed up for the marriage boot camp, stay treat. I say call it what it is, it's a, it's a boot camp. I think the master of the banquet would have liked it very much if this new family would have come, if they would have made preparations to Attend the banquet. Bring the new wife. Bring the new husband. There are some people here that they may not know. Invite them. Fellowship. But instead, the man just says, I cannot come. Again, he doesn't offer an excuse. He doesn't say, please have me excuse. He simply says, I can't come. This is an easy trap for us to fall into. Families are growing, kids are getting older, getting into more things. The more things that kids get involved in, the more things I'm involved in, the less time I have available to do other things. Anybody been there? I can't tell you how many times we spent following this kid to show choir stuff. Or maybe, maybe your deal is the kids are now gone. And you're celebrating your empty nest, and so you find yourself, husband and wife, involved in other things. But just like work or business or purchases, large or small, family can also, if we're not careful, become an all-consuming thing. And I want you to pay attention, family, that nobody's excuse was in and of itself a sin. Right? God says if a man don't work, he don't eat. Right? So it's okay to have a business. It's okay to have a job. It's okay to have a career. There's nothing wrong with buying land or livestock. The, 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 the Bible commends enterprise and hard work. Again, consider the Proverbs woman, right? She considereth a field and buy it. She's doing business. She's buying land. There's nothing wrong with marriage and family. Again, the Bible says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains the favor of the Lord. 
The point is, family, that good things can become bad things if they are not properly ordered. If they keep us from faith and fellowship with God, those good things are bad things. All were invited. All gave excuses. What came as a result? Verse 21. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry. The master became angry. And every now and then you come to parts of Scripture where you just kind of have to sit with it. This was one of those things for me because we don't like to think about God being angry, right? You talk to people, especially people in the world, but sometimes people in the church as well. God is love. God is happiness. He's supposed to be around always doing good and sprinkling unicorns and rainbows everywhere. God's not supposed to be angry. God doesn't have a right to be angry, even though we get angry, right? How many times have you been angry on your job? How many times have you been angry in traffic? That's just me. We get angry about far more trivial things. You ain't going to even talk about how many times you've been angry with your spouse. Amen. Another plug for the marriage retreat. Do come, do come. But we get angry about trivial things and expect God not to be angry. The master of the house was angry. This is the Greek word or gizo, Strong's number 3710. And it's the same word used in Ephesians 4 when Scripture tells us, be angry but sin not. And it means what you think it would mean to express anger or displeasure. Why was the master of the house angry? Because he had prepared this great banquet, this stellar party. He invested so much in preparing for it. He invited so many to come and feast with him, to fellowship with him, and everybody he invited. Scripture says all. When I was here, I had to go back and look at the scripture to make sure, but it does say all, everyone he invited, stood him up. Everyone he invited rejected his kindness. Anybody in here ever been stood up? No? Ever been rejected? Was it a good feeling? Or was it as the kids say, they probably don't say this anymore, did it leave you feeling some kind of way? Why would the master of the house be any different? So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to the servants, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. The invitees gave excuses, found themselves not only excused but excluded. Verse 24 says, for I tell you, none of these men who were invited shall taste of my banquet. Be very careful in how you manage the master's invitation because grace despised could very well be grace forfeited. They rejected his invitation and in return, he says, no one, none of these men shall taste of my banquet. All who received the initial initial invitation to the banquet made excuses and chose not to attend. Did the master say, well, that's okay. You know, things happen. I'll, I'll just reschedule it. No. Today, if you hear my voice, harden not your hearts, as in the rebellion, Hebrews 3 and 15, the master will not reschedule the day the banquet is for an appointed time. And when all is ready, there will be one final call. In the face of their excuses, this rejection didn't cancel the master's plan. The master simply turned his attentions elsewhere. The invitation was expanded. 
Verse 21, so the servant came and responded, uh, excuse me, and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servants, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, sir, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. The repetition of part of 13 here is very intentional. If you would recall when we read as we opened service this morning, Jesus confronting the ruler of the Pharisees for not having invited the poor or the maimed or the lame or the blind to lunch after Sunday service. You see this Pharisee, like most Pharisees and most of the religious elite among the Jews, viewed these kind of people, the poor, the lame, the blind, the maimed, uh, uh, as having been judged by God. In fact, they despised them because in their condition they were unable to satisfy the traditional uh, 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 laws of ritual purity. Not like they could help their condition, right? Right? These same people, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame were thought of to be unworthy of the kingdom. This could have easily been the reason why the man in in verse 15 was moved to say, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Could he have been seeking to correct Jesus? Assuming that since in his view, people like the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame were not worthy of God's great banquet. If they're not worthy of God's great banquet, then why should he, this ruler of the Pharisees, invite them to his banquet? It is God's kingdom, family. It is God's great banquet. And he says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy to whom I will show show mercy. Exodus 33, 19. How will you respond to God's invitation? How will you respond to his grace, to his compassion, to his mercy? Isn't it interesting that the ones who thought that they were good are the ones who rejected God's goodness? And the ones who were considered unworthy are the ones who accepted the invitation. Pastor and author Stephen Cole shares this thought concerning that. Quote, The striking thing is that everyone who accepted the invitation could have come up with seemingly legitimate excuses for not coming. Again, everybody earlier who gave an excuse, it wasn't a valid excuse. But he says here, they could have seemingly gave legitimate excuses. The poor man could say, I don't have anything decent to wear to such a feast. This is God's party. The crippled man could say, I can't get anyone to carry me there. The blind could say, I can't see to find my way. The lame could say, it hurts me too much to walk on my bad leg. Excuse me. Those along the highways and hedges, the street people could say, I haven't had a bath in days and my clothes are dirty and ragged. I can't come. I love this. But they all accepted the offer because the servant convinced them, one, that they are welcome. And two, they clearly saw their own need. Do you see your need this morning? Do you see yourself among the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame? Do you see yourself among the outcasts and the outsiders found as the master commands his servant to go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in? Do you see yourself struggling with doubt caught in seemingly never-ending cycles of sin? Do you see your own need? If you've ever been looked at or called unworthy by others, if you've ever looked at or called yourself unworthy, I have good news for you today because God's invitation is for you. 
In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we hear these words in the scribes of the Pharisees when they saw that he was coming to eat with sinners, or excuse me, that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? 17, and when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners do not allow shame or guilt to keep you from accepting God's invitation. Don't allow pride to keep you from accepting God's invitation. Don't allow any excuse, however seemingly valid, to keep you from accepting God's invitation. He says those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, if you are a sin-sick soul on this morning, God's invitation is for you. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. One final thought as we close on this morning. The role of those who accept God's invitation is twofold. The first is to feast and fellowship with God and to enjoy him and to experience him in word and worship. And that is both in the here and now and that is also in the great banquet and beyond. The second is to invite others to do the same. The first one we may be doing okay at. You may feel that you do a good job of fellowshipping with God. You spend time in the Word. You spend time in prayer. You're engaged actively in worship. But how are you doing in the second one? Are you inviting others to take part in the same fellowship with God that you're taking part in? Remember, as he sent the servants out to the lame and the poor and the crippled, they came back and gave the report that there is still room. And then he gives word to go out into the highways and the hedges and to compel men to come in that his house may be filled. You who have accepted his invitation have a part to play in that. 2 Corinthians 5 Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, those who have accepted his invitation, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He said to his servants, go. That is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Don't reject God's grace and don't hoard God's grace. I'm going to borrow from Crawford and say, are you tracking with me, fam? Scripture says if our gospel be hid, it's hid to those that are lost. God didn't shed his light in you for you to put it under a bushel. He shed it in you to compel men to come. Amen. And since he is the inexhaustible treasure that we know he is, And he hasn't sent Jesus, the sky hadn't cracked and the trumpet hasn't sound. We know that means there is still room at his table. And we know his heart is that his house be filled. We know from 2 Peter that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We know that he loves all deeply. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Why should we not go and compel men to come? Amen? Final statement I'm going to borrow from my brother again. Go and tell the world about your beautiful Savior. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day.